Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Adrian Grass and I lead the market access practice for Ipsos within the APAC region. Um, I'd like to start by thanking you all for taking the time to join our special APAC Digital Doctor webinar. There's been a significant amount of interest in this topic, um, so it's great to have so many of you join us today. We're excited to be launching this APAC Digital Doctor 2020. Um, today we'll give you an exclusive look at results and insights from our study of close to 700 doctors' perspective on digital and connected health across nine APAC markets. Our session today uh, is being led by Ipsos's expert on APAC connected health. Um, we have Drew Norris, Director of Healthcare for Singapore and Malaysia, as well as Ipsos's Global Head of Medical Devices and Diagnostics, and also Hannah Osborne, um, a Research Director, also with our Medical Devices and Diagnostic team in APAC, based in Singapore with us. You can read more about Drew and Hannah's background in the bios that are in front of you on the screen. Um, and just to orient you and provide some guiding notes, today's presentation will run for approximately 30 minutes. Uh, and the rest of the time we'll use to address the questions that you're providing live. So we encourage you to use the uh, question function in the console um, to submit a question privately to our team at any time. Uh, we'll address as many questions as possible within the time that we have and certainly we'll follow up with you directly afterwards if we can't get to all of the questions. Um, should you have any technical issues um, during the event, please uh, use the same question box to chat for support. Uh, additionally, we encourage you to visit and download from the handout section in our events console um, for information on, for example, purchasing the digital doctor report, um, which we're highlighting today and to access um, an overview of Ipsos's digital and connected health expertise. Uh, finally, uh, I'd like to mention that today's session is being recorded um, and will be sent by email in case you wish to either revisit the materials or perhaps share it with your colleagues. And so with that, um, I'll now hand over to Drew uh, to help us get started. Um, so Drew, over to you. Thank you very much, Adrian, and a warm welcome to everyone. And thank you for, for joining us today. It's great to see so many of you uh, tuning in. Um, before we go into the main findings of, uh, of Digital Doctor, I want to take some time to talk a little bit about COVID-19. Um, it somewhat changed our agenda for this, topic, for this uh, study, um, and in fact, even our approach. Most of our um, data for this research was collected between November 2019 and February of this year, so pre-COVID-19 in the majority of the markets. But it does give us a good indication of how different markets were prepared and how they've, you know, they've dealt with the pandemic. But in addition, Ipsos has gone out and collected huge amounts of data during uh, COVID-19. And that includes revisiting many of our healthcare professionals who took part in our original research for Digital Doctor. And we'll be sharing some of those findings throughout the presentation today. So this data doesn't just give us an insight into the current landscape, it gives us an insight into pre-COVID, and it also gives us an insight into what the future may look like after COVID-19. Now, the pandemic, of course, has devastated our world in, in so many ways. It's affected every single one of us, um, and it's hard to find any positives, really. But one upside of COVID-19, as it's highlighted major flaws in healthcare systems around the world and how they can be overcome with technology. You know, we've seen the, the use of connected health um, becoming critical um, in managing the care of the pandemic in many countries of this, um, of this episode. And this will only accelerate the transition to a modern digital healthcare system. There's a great deal of information out there um, on, on how society has changed. Ipsos has produced maybe 10 or 20 reports on it already. Um, but what I want to do now before we go into the main findings of our research is just to highlight seven key areas where we see the greatest change in relation to digital healthcare. The first being healthcare professional education and training. Now, many physicians have needed to take part in virtual training and conferences for the first time. And in fact, when we spoke to physicians globally, one in two stated that they would now attend a conference online versus in person, even higher in certain countries that are more attuned to the digital channels. And 60% are more likely to seek education resources online. Telehealth virtual care 
at scale. And there will be a shift from hospital to home uh, as, as the point of care. Patients you know, should not have the need to go into hospital for all tests and consultations and take up resources, uh, increasing uh, their exposure to hospital infections. Remote care has become normal for many people in many practices at the moment. And we do expect it to continue after the pandemic to some degree, although it will differ greatly between markets, and we'll touch on that later. Virtual rep visits. Now, many doctors have been approached um, in different specialties, including you know, GPs and, and, and surgeons and cardiologists, oncologists, all different uh, specialties have been approached to take a virtual rep call. And most of them go on and do it, and about nine in 10 we've found from our research. However, we've also found that the majority find these calls to be less useful than the previous in-person visits, but they did feel that they will become part of future practice. Um, so we see this as an area for pharma and device companies focusing on moving forward and certainly an area that needs to be improved. Hospital-based reps um, are actually not expected to return anytime soon. And in fact, 50% of doctors in China felt that hospital-based reps may become virtual entirely in the future. Uh, the jury's still out on that one. I think time will tell. Fast tracking of new technology. Uh, we've seen significant amounts of digital tech being introduced during the pandemic. Um, and specifically, artificial intelligence is critical in taking global healthcare systems and institutions to the next level. Um, it, it was actually an AI system that predicted a China-based epidemic arising even before COVID-19. And these types of systems will be vital in the future to predict um, future pandemics, although I hope we, we won't have any in the near future. But more importantly, AI algorithms are needed to help us with resource management in overloaded healthcare systems. We will see a use in increase uh, in virtual and mixed reality, not only in training, which is it's, it's uh, most frequent use at the moment, but also in assisting with, with patient care and accessing records and images and not having to worry about touching uh, different documents or even being close to other healthcare, healthcare professionals. This is already happening in many markets at the moment, such as the UK um, and China during the pandemic. Global population health data, you know, for the first time for many, many consumers, we're being exposed to huge amounts of big data um, for healthcare consumers, patients, doctors, we're all getting real-time global health information on a scale we've never seen before. And it's helping us understand the spread of the virus, it's helping us understand which countries are recovering, which countries are reaching their peak, which countries may have a second wave. And it's expected this type of big data statistics will become more mainstream, uh, not just for uh, pandemics, but also for other health information to advise on business decision, um, as well as personal decisions. Reluctance to seek help during the pandemic. Um, you know, it, it's fairly similar globally, although there are differences in different markets. But here in Asia, we've seen that those countries heavily affected by the pandemic have seen a significant drop in capacities. Outpatient volumes are down to 50%, inpatient 60%, surgeries down to, to 20 or 30%. Um, these are all expected, of course, to bounce back after the pandemic to at least initially 120% capacity. Um, but many surgeries will be delayed uh, further than that. I, I even read in, in the BBC News today, I know we're, we're focusing on Asia Day, but the UK is now looking at a 10 million waiting list uh, for procedures in the NHS compared to the normal three to four million. Now, the situation is, is of course partly due to physician or ward or OR availability. But in many cases, for certain specialties, it's patient fear. In Singapore, we recently spoke to 500 Singapore residents and 41% said they were concerned to visit a GP due to the fact they felt they may contract COVID-19. That went up to 51% when considering to visit a hospital-based specialist. And 17% of those surveyed in Singapore also said they've put off a procedure or test due to COVID-19. And finally, acceleration of reform in digital health policy. COVID-19 will speed up healthcare reform in government policy and reimbursement, which will, allow, will, which will allow technologies like artificial intelligence and digital therapeutics to rise in importance. Even during the pandemic, there has been a surge in getting new devices and test kits out quickly. Uh, and it, it's been vital that countries strike the right balance between speed and ensuring that they're 
products are accurate and safe. Now, in, in most countries that has happened, but there are examples where products have been rushed out, um, such as certain test kits not, not being accurate. But we do anticipate reforms moving a bit quicker. Now, focusing in on our, on our main study today, um, it's worth noting at this point that this research is part of a global uh, piece of work that Ipsos conducted with over 1,700 um, healthcare professionals, most of which were GPs. There were some exceptions in, in some of the Asian markets in, in Korea, for example. And the data was collected between November and November 2019 and February of this year. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, in many markets, additional data was collected to understand the change during COVID-19. So today we're going to share some high-level data from the APAC region specifically. Um, however, there are detailed country reports available for each market, as well as a comprehensive global report. Now, our, our research covered many different areas of connected health, but today we're going to focus in on three key ones uh, for you. Digital activity, uh, technology awareness, connected health behaviour, and connected health beliefs. So we start with digital activity and awareness of technologies. Um, with the exception of China, and I'm going to call China out quite a bit throughout this presentation, traditional channels have always ruled in Asia. So outside of China, they've always ruled. And this remains the case, uh, whether it's in-person one-on-one meetings with a rep or discussions with peers or in-person attendance at a medical conference. It's always been a very popular channel um, in Asia Pacific. Now, of course, COVID-19 has changed this. It's forced doctors to use digital channels. And the next step will be for manufacturers to perfect these new methods of communication. You know, can virtual conferences run alongside real ones to increase attendance? How can that experience be enhanced? Could virtual reality be used, for example? That being said, you know, even before COVID-19, we've seen a great increase in the use of digital education compared to three years ago. If you looked at this information back in, in 2017, when we did our first digital doctor survey, these percentages would all be at least 10% lower. Now, of course, with COVID-19, this has elevated these numbers to two or three times the amount during the, during the pandemic. It will be interesting to see where they rest afterwards, and we do have some insights into some behavior, which we'll share later on. To look at this in a bit more detail, even you know, pre-COVID-19, one-on-one -on -one virtual meetings were quite high in China, however, incredibly low in countries like Singapore and Malaysia. Patient support services, such as apps, um, again, high in China, but also high in markets like Vietnam and Indonesia that have seen growth in fields such as telemedicine. Assessing social media content has increased dramatically for physicians over the past three years. We can even see this in Ipsos, where we do a lot of social media work. It wasn't something that was possible with physicians three years ago. Now it is because there is activity happening um, online. And it's worth noting that it is significantly higher amongst millennial doctors versus the baby boomer generation. And as I said earlier, remote access to conferences has increased and is expected to remain high, assuming conferences are on virtually post-COVID-19. Moving on to looking at general awareness of different types of connected health in Asia Pacific. And here we do see a fairly similar situation to our global uh, picture. There is high awareness of telehealth and patient, uh, remote patient monitoring. It's not surprising. There's been massive growth in this, spect in this sector, especially with those patients managing chronic conditions such as diabetes. In terms of whether they're least aware, I'm not surprised by blockchain technology. Um, it is relatively hard to understand unless you've personally used it. But it's interesting that only one in two are aware of digital therapeutics um, and chatbots, uh, despite there being quite a lot of activity in press and the industry. So it's important for those active physicians to be made aware and educated into these developments. Now with awareness, it doesn't always translate into knowledge. Um, if we look at Asia Pacific data, we see that although nine in 10 doctors are aware of artificial intelligence and remote patient monitoring, only three, roughly three in 10 claim to know a lot about it and the benefits that it brings. I mean, AI is a, it's a word that's used a lot in healthcare, of course, and there are different uses. But clearly, primary care doctors need more and clearer information and education on how these benefits can help them improve their practice and the practice of their colleagues. But even with telehealth, I mean, where awareness is very high, only one in two claim to be knowledgeable about it. 
Um, however, again, I would stress that this does vary a great deal between countries within Asia Pacific. If we then take a closer look specifically at telehealth, we can see that you know, in Asia Pacific, 49% of GPs um, have, used, uh, have used telehealth and 30% are currently using. And when I say currently, this is in February, uh, between, between November and February uh, 2020. It's not shown here either on the slide, but even pre-COVID, uh, a further 35% said they wanted to start using telemedicine in the next six to 12 months. Now, of course, for the majority of people, that did happen because of the pandemic. Back when these questions were asked, we also explored what the barriers were for not using technology more. And it really focused on two key areas. One was the lack of training and, and how to practice telemedicine. This was mentioned by just under 50%. And then also just under 50% mentioned the lack of required technology, such as adequate internet speeds. Although this was particularly high in countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, and Malaysia. Now, both of these areas can be addressed with help from manufacturers and especially government, although COVID-19 has again accelerated that process already as the system has demanded new channels uh, to, to connect with patients. Now, if we look at how COVID-19 has changed this, on the left-hand side of this slide, we see some global data. Now, note this was collected through a different survey through one of our partners, but it does give us a good idea into activity pre, during, and post-pandemic. As I say, this is global. We can see here that 64% pre-COVID had used, and then afterwards, after the peak, 81%. So there is a global lift there. Now on the right-hand side, we see data from our survey here in Singapore, where we went back out to our GPs. A few things to bring out here for your attention. Now, understandably, there is an uplift um, in awareness and knowledge, of course. But although, you know, in Singapore, the actual telemedicine usage has only increased from 23% to 30%. That's one of the lowest in the world. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. Um, we're quite unique um, here in Singapore. I'm based in Singapore. We have one of the largest number of GPs per capita in the world. Um, they are not in short supply. And we also have one of the shortest waiting times in the world. So the ability to see a GP here um, is, still, is still very, fairly easy and with the measures put in place by the Singapore government you can still visit um, a GP. Now that being said when we spoke to consumers 23 percent of the 500 Singaporeans we went out to did indicate they would be more likely to use telemedicine post-COVID-19 which is encouraging. We will see an uplift but it won't be as much perhaps as in some other countries. I just want to take some time now um, before we, we move to the second half of, of, the, uh, of the presentation to focus specifically on China. It does deserve to be called out separately. Uh, we see a very different picture here versus the rest of Asia Pacific. Um, and in fact, the world, in fact. Now the data on this slide is pre-COVID-19 in China. Uh, so we saw that 96% knew of telehealth, 87% had used and 66% were currently using. Now, these numbers are actually higher than are in many markets globally during the pandemic. And in China, during COVID-19, these numbers all rose to over 90%, and of, and of course, the knowledge rose to 100%. Now, the use of telemedicine in China pre-pandemic was higher than anywhere else in the world by some margin. This adoption, it's not by accident, it's not by culture, it's primarily driven by government reform that's resulted in China leading this field really for the last five years. There have been a number of schemes and investments in, in private enterprise, but the driving force have been some very detailed um, and comprehensive government policy. You can go back to 2014 and the NHFPC, the National Health and Family, Family Planning Commission, issued the first document for telehealth in China and defined the scope for telehealth, covering remote pathological diagnosis, remote imaging, remote monitoring, remote consultation, and case discussion. It was the first country in the world to do this. And then in 2016, this scope was redefined to include remote intensive care, remote surgical training. And then two years ago, the National Health Commission issued comprehensive documents defining telehealth qualifications for medical institutions, but also practicing physicians. Again, the first country in the world to do this at this level. 
And in the same year, the, the National Telemedicine and Connected Health Center was set up in China between the Chinese and Japanese Friendship Hospital in Beijing, which became a hub connecting over 130 hospitals around China. And it was this center that was appointed in February of this year to lead the national platform for monitoring, diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19 and was in fact instrumental in allowing for the pandemic to be managed. At this point, I'm going to, to pass over to my colleague, um, Hannah Osborne, who Adrian introduced earlier, to take us through the last two sections. Thanks, Drew. Um, so we're going to take you through some of the data around the use and impacts of Connected Health. So what kinds of platforms are being used by GPs in APAC? And, and as Drew mentioned, this data is, is mostly pre-COVID and you can see here almost three quarters of, across APAC, three quarters of GPs are already using Connected Health before the pandemic hit. So this was very much a, a kind of a trend uh, be, before that has been very much boosted by, by COVID. Um, of the kind of three main types of platforms that are being used uh, in Connected Health, mostly it's apps to support clinical decision making, and that's actually uh, particularly in, in places like Singapore, uh, and also medical devices in diagnostics, again, particularly in Indonesia, uh, and, and all of these are, are very widely used in China. Uh, and the third one is the use of kind of remote video conferencing, either for consultations with patients, for education, uh, or for kind of, you know, um, conferences and webinars. Um, so those were the three main kind of platforms that were being used pre-COVID. Um, we do know that pretty much all of these have been on the rise during the pandemic, particularly the telehealth platform and video conferencing, that's particularly seen an uplift. When we ask our healthcare professionals what they're actually using Connected Health for, it's quite an interesting picture. So again, this is an amalgamation across the whole of APEC, uh, and the trend holds true across most of the markets. And typically, pre-pandemic, um, you know, Connected Health solutions were mostly being used for kind of back office functions. So things like health record maintenance, information management, and some medical education and training as well. Um, the secondary uses were around the more fr kind of front office and um, things like patient monitoring, clinical decision making and communication amongst themselves and also with patients as well. We do know that during the pandemic and, and COVID, particularly that secondary traditional use has seen a massive boost. So much more remote patient monitoring, much more kind of remote and um, virtual communication. Uh, and certainly those two have really, really shot up. Uh, and we've also got other studies and other data that shows that at least one in five healthcare professionals expect to continue using more video conferences and virtual consultations, patient monitoring and medical education. So those are the areas that we particularly see as being boosted by the pandemic and also will persist afterwards. The other thing to note here is that it's not actually all the same across all the markets. And, you know, Drew made it very clear, and we will be mentioning this a lot, but China has always been at the forefront of usage. But even some of our more typically conservative markets like Singapore, for example, they actually are one of the leaders in using connected health for clinical decision making, for example. And Japan, which is by far the most conservative market for using some of these tools, actually are the leader in this region um, for the um, time management. Uh, so if you are looking at developing or designing tools, I think knowing the, the familiarity and the common uses of them per market can be very helpful. The next thing we're showing is we are actually showing you a lot of the individual country data because it's really quite striking. So this here shows you the proportion of the healthcare professionals that actually actively recommend a connected health device for their patients to use that they also use that in consultations with their patients. So it's not just something they leave their patients to use on their own, you know, like a typical weight management or calorie counter app. This is something they use proactively in their consultations. And you can see that China is really leading the world, actually. So 71% of our healthcare professionals were already recommending these apps and, and devices to their patients pre-COVID. Uh, and that's the largest in the world. You can see it's higher than the States, it's higher than most European countries that are shown here, 
and it's obviously the highest in APAC as well. So very much leading the way, and that's very much because their policy has really been proactive around the use of such tools for quite a long time now. So it's been a, at least a few years that, that they've been using such tools, they're very familiar with them. It's interesting to see that Malaysia and India are also quite high in this region. Some of you may be surprised by that. Certainly Malaysia does tend to be more on the conservative side for some of these platforms. Um, but you know, when, you, when we look into the reason for this, there's actually, in these two markets particularly, there have been a number of government initiatives to encourage remote monitoring and use of these apps for, for patient uh, review and consultation particularly around lifestyle diseases, so diabetes, obesity, hypertension, um, and you see um, you know, an increasing burden on these healthcare systems because of these lifestyle diseases and the way they are, they're kind of ex rapidly expanding. Um, so that's where we're seeing um, that kind of uplift in those markets. So it's always good to be aware of what policies and initiatives are in place in each country. It really affects the, the uptake of these, um, of these platforms. The final point in this section is just to explain around training and you'll probably all notice um, that the percentages on this slide add up to more than 100%. So our GPs are using multiple ways to train themselves and, and, and become proficient in using connected health platforms and tools and that will depend on the complexity of the tool itself. So if you are thinking of rolling something like this out or designing something like this, you'll have to make sure you have the, the appropriate level of training that goes with it. You can see most of our, our physicians are kind of training themselves on the device or even just looking up for advice online. And, and if something's relatively intuitive and quite straightforward, then that might be sufficient just to put something online. A good 43% though are receiving training directly from the manufacturer, which is higher than any other region in the world. It's higher than, than Europe, uh, e, uh, America and LATAM. Uh, and so there may be an expectation in this region for a bit more hand-holding and a bit more manufacturer-led training and it's always worth being aware of that uh, if you are looking to develop uh, or, or use any of these tools. We'll now take you through the final section of our report uh, which is around beliefs, so motivations and concerns. Um, and the first slide here just, uh, just shows you what some of the GPs actually believe, uh, what they say is the truth and what they think might be a bit of a myth. So the main things that they strongly agree with are, you know, the future is all about new data streams and, you know, things like electronic patient records, connected health, genomics. They're very, very open to that um, being, being something that's, that's going to become part of the way they work. Uh, particularly genomics, you know, when we're talking about um, tailored health care and preventative medicine, um, that's something that they certainly see on the horizon as well. And they do really agree, uh, and we'll see a little bit more information about this on the next couple of slides, but they really see that connected health devices and tools are really enabling patients. So they're getting better access to their data, better knowledge, and they can be more proactive about managing their own health. What they don't believe in necessarily is that um, they don't think they don't see a time where you will have to use a kind of compliance or monitoring app to alongside treatments or drugs to be able to get the reimbursement. They don't see that as being a reality. Um, they also interestingly don't see digital platforms as a replacement uh, for sales reps in the future. Uh, which is quite interesting. I mean, it chimes back to what Drew was saying earlier about kind of there's still an importance of sales reps. They still really prefer the in-person visits, um, but there may be a, a need for different channels now. But, you know, we've, we've had other studies as well that show that the doctors are OK to, to do something of, of a virtual video conference with a sales rep as long as it's a sales rep that they're familiar with. So that reputation and that role of a sales rep is still important. And as long as the information is useful and they're learning something new, um, then using these new or lesser used communication channels, such as kind of video conferencing, et cetera, is, is perfectly acceptable and, and may very well be uh, part of the future um, way of communicating. And the final thing that they don't agree with is that connected health tools are not necessarily that reliable. Um, and you'll see that there are a number of different options out there in the world. And I think and it boils down to there not necessarily being an awful lot of evidence yet about the impact on clinical outcomes or cost of healthcare, et cetera, that we'll see a bit more information about in just a moment.
We're, when we um, look at the trust and barriers here, so the overall sentiment from our respondents is that they're kind of both excited and anxious about the role of AI in the future, but more of them are excited than they are anxious. So there is certainly a very kind of open-minded um, uh, kind of mindset about new technology and about its adoption. Um, and in terms of trust, they actually do trust these tools and apps to come from a public authority rather than a private company, uh, particularly in countries like China and Singapore, and actually, interestingly, Vietnam as well. Um, so if you are a, a private company and you're looking to, to delve into the world of connected health and these kinds of platforms, it may be worth looking at public-private partnerships to kind of really make that uh, a very kind of, um, you know, reliable and trustworthy offering. Now, the barriers are very, very similar to what we've seen in the, in the previous Digital Doctor reports and um, patient misinterpretation, incorrect self-diagnosis and data security being the main three. Unsurprisingly, these are bigger barriers as perceived as larger barriers in our more conservative markets like Singapore and Malaysia. And they're not as much, uh, they're a much kind of lesser barrier in countries like China, where they're much more familiar with this way of operating already. What's really interesting about the barriers is that when we look at some of our post-COVID survey data, we see the patient misinterpretation, incorrect self-diagnosis, and a little bit around hypochondria shooting right up. So that, that becomes an even bigger barrier. But the data security actually it, 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 it kind of pales in comparison to that. That doesn't really change very much. So it's kind of a situation of needs must, you know, that, okay, we'll get over the data security issue for now. We'll trust that these platforms are safe, but we're really worried actually about, you know, what the patients will think and how they'll self-diagnose, et cetera. And another barrier that, that, that rears its head in the COVID era is around regulation. So perhaps in the rush and the scramble to start using some of these platforms, some of the doctors are starting to ask questions around, you know, are they regulated? Some of them don't feel that they necessarily have enough training to deliver care to patients virtually, and, and they're not sure if this is, you know, always the most effective way. So there's another few, a few other areas of concern that have popped up and um, that can be problem solved uh, moving forward. Here we see some information around what the doctors um, believe about the, the impacts of connected health can be. And all our row in green is what they're convinced about. And it's very much around the enablement of patients, you know, giving them better access to data, allowing them to be more proactive and preventative with health issues, um, yet giving them ownership of that and just motivating them more to be more in control of their lifestyle, particularly diet and exercise. Things that they're not really convinced of yet and maybe an area to look into to, to, to collect data and evidence for these kinds of values are around those clinical endpoints. So, you know, does it really reduce mortality or morbidity? Does it really reduce cost of health and does it reduce hospital and clinic visits? It may be that it does, but perhaps there's just not enough convincing evidence or data anecdotally or otherwise out there that that message isn't really getting through to the healthcare professionals yet. Um, the last slide in this section before we conclude is just, is again, it's from, from one of our partners surveys actually, and it's just, you know, to ask our healthcare professionals now that we're in this kind of COVID dominated world, what are their biggest fears for patients who actually don't have COVID-19? And, and very much along the lines of what Drew was saying, it's the fact that they may not be seeking timely or appropriate care. They're, they're so afraid of contracting the disease or spreading the disease that they're not actually going to see a doctor at all. Um, so that's the biggest concern, but it does push more patients into that virtual consultation world. And the concerns then become around you know, do are patients able to communicate their symptoms effectively over a virtual platform, over a video conference? And are they able to understand the instructions also given by a nurse or a GP and that they may now have to be getting that training or explanation over, again, a video conference? So some areas to think about, you know, if we are going to be designing these platforms, are there ways we can kind of enhance um, the patient usability and ability to communicate those kinds of things? So just to summarise kind of briefly what we've talked about today, 
Um, you know, Connected Health in APAC is very much dominated and led by China. We've seen that on almost all of these slides. We've called out something specific uh, where China is, is really ahead of, ahead of the game. Um, you know, they're, they're using the, these platforms the most, they're recommending the most to their patients. Um, but there are other markets in, in this region that are, that are also kind of very you know, excited and interested in starting to really adopt these tools as well. You know, we'd like to call out Korea, Indonesia and Vietnam as three markets that particularly uh, are, in, are interested in, and, like I say, rapidly adopting these platforms. Our more conservative markets are definitely Japan, Singapore and Malaysia. Um, but as we've pointed out again throughout, there are little pockets of certain functions and certain uses that they will be interested and familiar with. So it is just about, as with anything in, in this region, knowing those markets and knowing where the nuances are to, to really make the most of that. It's interesting to, to know about the China thing, and we know that they've kind of recovered quite quickly almost from, from COVID-19. And that's, there's many reasons for that, but we're, we're convinced that one of the main reasons for that is they had such a good telehealth and connected health set up in China already. So they were able to really fall back on that to keep their healthcare infrastructure and system kind of running. So uh, we have no doubts that that's kind of contributed to that. Which brings us on to our next area um, of, of conclusion, which is the, the impact of COVID itself. So we know that at least 90% of healthcare professionals have now used telehealth during COVID-19. Half of them, it's for the first time that they're using it specifically for patient consultations. So now we've broken the seal, we've got a whole load of doctors who have used this and, and most of them are having positive experiences. We've done surveys asking them about how their experience has been and it's predominantly positive and, and one in five expect to to see that usage increasing after COVID as well. So this, this is kind of the, the breakaway moment for us to really change things. Uh, and then just to mirror what Drew said at the beginning, you know, the three main areas are the use of communication and information channels are shifting. So for conferences, education, even with patients and for sales reps, it's all, you know, the, the virtual, uh, you know, um, video conference route is, is very much acceptable now. It's still not preferred. I mean, in person is still preferred, but um, you know, the 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 video conferences is a possibility. Um, adoption of technology and data solutions like big data, like AI, like um, virtual and mixed reality, and then attitudes around health as well. And you know, Drew did mention at the beginning around, and, and I've repeated it. You know, patients are afraid to go to their doctors because because of the risk of contracting COVID. There also is another stream of attitude that people are taking their health a lot more seriously now as well. So especially around preventative health and, and, and that ownership of, of being healthier. Um, so hopefully we can use all of this to, to put things into place for the future. Uh, and what's needed there in the future. So a, a four things we really wanted just to call out in terms of where we can perhaps shape things in a better way is, is certainly on delivering training to healthcare professionals on how to practice virtually via telehealth. It's not something that's included in their training modules today and perhaps an area of, 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 of not so much confidence for them. Um, data to demonstrate the effectiveness and supporting clinical evidence for some of these connected health tools would certainly be compelling. Uh, and also anything we can do to alleviate the healthcare professional concerns about misinterpretation from patients. Uh, it may be that patients don't misinterpret things as much as we think, so it would be nice to get some insight and intel into, into that. And also things, parts of the tools and parts of the platforms to be designed in such a way that really support the patients. So to help them, to help them describe symptoms and to understand instructions as well with that virtual setting. So that is in a nutshell, everything we've had to share with you. I think we've got a little bit of time for some Q&A. So I'm just gonna pass this to Adrian who will check out some of your questions. Thanks both for the excellent presentation, really fascinating um, stuff. Uh, so as Anna said, we'll move on to a discussion. Um, try to look at uh, some of the questions that popped up most frequently and I'll start with this one. So. Um, with so many apps and wearables and options for connected health tools now, how do we as a business choose or help our HCPs choose the right one? And how do we measure the value of these tools? That's a great question. I can give that one a stab first. Um, thank you for sending that one in. So how do we evaluate the tools and how do we decide which is the best one? 
I think it obviously really depends on what the tool is and who the end user for that tool is, et cetera. And if we go from the assumption that you're not, as a, as a, as a manufacturer or a company, you're not making that platform yourself because then you'd obviously uh, recommend your own platform as the best one. But um, if, if we assume that it's for patients and it's something around lifestyle, because there are so many apps out there for calorie counting and meditation and exercise steps, etc. There's so many. Um, and even for something like diabetes, you know, a lot of the blog glucose monitor companies have their own app, but there's also other apps that, that patients can choose. So there is a lot to choose from. So how do we, how do we, how do we tell our customers which ones they should use? I think internally you have to have um, kind of a, almost a list of criteria that must be met by a, by a tool to support the function that you're trying to get from that. So whether that's whether it's approved um, from a regulatory standpoint, what kind of data inputs and outputs it has, um, whether it's kind of what functionality it has. So very basic things that you can filter those tools by um, those criteria kind of that you set internally. And then there almost has to be an external evaluation as well. So what do the um, healthcare professionals that are already using some of those platforms and tools think? What do they like? What don't they like? Why haven't they used other ones? And also the patients themselves. I mean, we've been working with a few, um, a few companies on designing some of these platforms, particularly for the patient use. And it's obviously crucial to get their input around usability. Um, so that we can, you know, uh, make recommendations of how to design and, and use a tool like that. So, yeah, internal, internal, internal list of criteria and external assessment would be where I would go with it. I think in terms of proving value, that's very much what we found in the in the data today is that that's kind of lacking right now, and they need to see a little bit more evidence around where the, the impact is and, and there's ways that we can help collect and, and, and prove that that kind of thing um adrian actually um as you're working in our market access team and do a lot around proving value as part of your pricing and market access studies maybe maybe you have something to add for that one well i think you've covered some of the points i mean just briefly that some of these solutions are now you know a concern that governments are looking into as well so i think it goes beyond just a the ATPs and the patients um, very much into the sort of the payer hands as well. So, I mean, for me, it, it's about really understanding the value across the different stakeholders that, that, you know, that solution is going to be touching and really understanding, you know, how values is, is represented for, for each. So I think in an ideal world, you'd sort of be optimizing your strategy to satisfy all three. And it's not necessarily the same sort of points that are going to appeal. So I think really understanding um, the sort of the array of stakeholders uh, around the technology is important here. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just move on to the next question. So the next one I've got here is what changes in behavior are expected to stay versus recede post-COVID? I mean, I think we've mentioned quite a few things about uh, the post-COVID and pre-COVID situations. So how might this uh, differ by specialty, condition, and market. Okay, let me have a stab at this one. Of course, we have, you know, covered quite a lot of this, um, you know, in the presentation. Uh, it's probably easy for me to say what I think will stay or what we think maybe will stay. Telehealth, for sure, absolutely, there's going to be an uplift. But as we've said, it's going to be different in, in different geographies. Some will be smaller, perhaps like Singapore. Even in, even in China, it might be smaller because they're already there, but you may see bigger jumps. Um, you know, in countries like Indonesia and Vietnam, we've already seen that. And I don't think it's just going to be for GPs. We're going to see it also for hospital-based doctors, you know, especially for, for meetings like routine checkups or sharing a, a really non-sort of sens sensitive and critical results that could be done very easily, um, you know, over a video call. So I think there will be selective uh, meetings and, and professions where that, that is done. I think we're also going to see an uplift in countries uh, where they have a large rural or you know, non-urban uh, population. Maybe I, I call out Indonesia, for example. They've seen how this technology can work. And if I look maybe at specialties like I mean, cardiology or radiology, you've got a massive concentration of these specialists in Jakarta. Um, quite rightly so, it's the capital city. And it, you can't ask these experts to, to move out to other areas of the country but of course people live there 
So I think you're going to have more and more remote stations where you've got the imaging or the diagnosis equipment there. Um, but the consultation analysis will be done remotely from those experts in the capital city. You'll see this in other, other countries as well. And, you know, in some markets, it's already happening. It, it, Saudi Arabia is a good example. It's already happening there. Um, physician learning certainly will be accelerated online. I think also in some markets, you could see, um, I mean, I think of Korea, for example, where they, they couldn't use to do it. Now they are using phone or online prescription. Um, and you may see this continuing. Uh, because they've seen the efficiencies that it can bring for certain drugs, of course. I think you'll see better interoperability as well with electronic patient records. Certain markets you've seen that patients have had to use the public and private sectors to deal with, with COVID-19 and they've noticed they just don't connect. So government reform will happen to move towards cloud-based models. Um, you know, I think it, it's uh, it's vital. And I also think that, you know, there will be protocols probably set up for better supply chain of, and distribution of medical products so that things like PPE, you know, can get to people in a quicker uh, scenario. What may not change, uh, we, we've touched on it and we haven't given you maybe a congrats on the reps. Um, there'll be elements of, of them being virtually, but I do still feel that they are still going to play very much a, a physical part um, across the spectrum. Uh, for sure, but it may be that a, a fraction of them are, are going to give the option to uh, to go virtual. Um, that's my my sort of thoughts. I think there's a lot more we could add, but I'm conscious of time. Absolutely, thanks, Drew. Um, in fact, just in the interest of time, um, I'm going to conclude our session here. There are a lot more questions that have come in, and of course, uh, we've made note of these. We'll be replying to you individually um, and giving us uh, giving your thoughts on on that. Um, as I mentioned, the recording is available. Um, it will be sent to you via email. Uh, additionally, please um, do download the handouts from the panel as well. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we also always welcome any opportunity to speak personally with you. So don't hesitate to get in touch and uh, certainly reach out if you want to know more about Digital Doctor. Thank you very much and uh, wish you a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone.